Today's readings pretty much say the same thing, but from different perspectives. Uh, the first one is from Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard Jesus and various religious leaders arguing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The second lesson was um, talked about extensively at our Monday Bible study. And I loved the imagery that it provided to put on a cloak of lightness was my favorite line in here. From Romans, owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably, as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. When I was a kid, my mom would let my siblings and me pick what we wanted for dinner when it was our birthday. And I always picked my mom's spaghetti and meat sauce. The pasta itself was a brand that you cannot get here on the West Coast. But I've got a feeling that pasta is pasta to a large extent. And so I don't think that's what it was that made me love it quite so much. It must have been the meat sauce. And I don't think my mom had any particularly special secret recipe or anything. She fried up some hamburger, put in some tomato paste, a little water, and some seasoning from a package she'd bought at the grocery store. But I loved her spaghetti and meat sauce, uh, so much so that I really didn't want to have spaghetti at my friend's house because it tasted different, and I liked my mom's the best. <laughs> the only explanation I have as to why my mom's tasted so good is that she must have had a secret ingredient. And that ingredient, I'm quite sure, was love. That she mixed love into her meat sauce. Now, some of you know that I grew up in a rambly old colonial house. I went on Zillow actually last night and found out that they listed it as being about three times the size of the parsonage. Uh, 3,800 square feet, something like that. Big old rambly house. And so we had a formal dining room in the front of the house and uh, a kitchen table, sort of a family room with a kitchen table in it uh, and toward the back of the house. And we only used the formal dining room um, for Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter when we had family over. And I think that had more to do with practicality than it had to do with, oh, this is a special occasion. Uh, because when cousins, particularly my mom's side of the family was there, we were uh, a dozen and we didn't fit around the kitchen table. <laughs> so we had to pull out the extra leaves and put them in the dining table to all fit around one table. When uh, I think back to those spaghetti dinners, 
we're not in the dining room. We're at the kitchen table. I see my dad standing up, reaching into a big aluminum pot with a pair of tongs to pull the spaghetti out and put it on a plate and then handing the plate to my mom for her to spoon up some of the meat sauce from the frying pan that she'd made the sauce in and putting it next to the buttery noodles for my brother, but on the noodles for my sisters and me. I found out actually as an adult that for my brother was a texture thing. If he didn't like the two textures together, he liked both of the foods, but he had to eat them one at a time. A little bit Sheldon-esque, maybe. I've got some of that too. Uh, Jesus, I think, would have been, I don't know if more comfortable is the right word, but he certainly would have been as comfortable at the kitchen table as he would have in the formal dining room. Not that he has anything against uh, pulling out the fine china and the silver that you get at your wedding and using that for uh, a big meal. But I think that he would have liked my mom's spaghetti and meat sauce. We can do that sort of thing with God or with Jesus. We can make them sit at the fancy table and the mahogany chairs with the fine china on the table. We can push them up into some heavenly throne and imagine one or both of them demanding worship and throwing down thunderbolts like Zeus. We can do this in spite of the fact there is no record of Jesus ever saying, worship me. He did say, follow me many, many times, but never worship me. He teaches us how to follow him with the two great commandments. Love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Richard Rohr muses about how we go about loving God. He writes, many of us seem to have concluded that we love God by attending church services. For some reason, we think that makes God happy, but I'm not sure why. That reminded me of a scene from the Big Bang Theory. When Sheldon and Amy first meet, they're set up on a blind coffee date. I'm Amy Farrah Fowler, you're Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> Hello, Amy Farrah Fowler. I'm sorry to inform you that you have been taken in by unsupportable mathematics designed to prey on the gullible and the lonely. Additionally, I'm being blackmailed with a hidden dirty sock. If that was slang, I'm unfamiliar with it. <laughs> If it was literal, I share your aversion to soiled hosiery. In any case, I'm here because my mother and I have agreed that I will date at least once a year. Interesting. My mother and I have the same agreement about church. I don't object to the concept of a deity, but I'm baffled by the notion of one that takes attendance. Well, then you might want to avoid East Texas. I too am baffled by the notion of a deity who takes attendance. <laughs> Rohr points out, Jesus never talked about attending services, although church can be a good container to begin with. The problem comes when we stop there, when we stop in the container of the church. This allows us to separate religion from the rest of our lives. Or says that the only way I know how to teach someone to love God and how I myself seek to love God is to love what God loves, which is everything and everyone, including you and me. Then we love with God's infinite love that can always flow through us. We're able to love people and things for themselves and in themselves and not for what they do for us. That takes both work and surrender. As we get ourselves out of the way, there is a slow but real expansion of consciousness. We're not the central reference point anymore. We love in greater and greater circles until we can finally do what Jesus did, love and forgive even our enemies. 
I read things like this and I wonder if I'll ever get there. I get how these two commandments are connected to love God with your whole being and to love your neighbor as yourself. Rohr explains what makes the connection practically. Jesus says the second commandment in Matthew's gospel, he says that the second commandment is like the first and he makes the rhetorical connection between the two. Jesus is saying that it's the same source and the same love that allows us to love ourselves, others, and God at the same time. I get how the two commandments are connected. I just wonder if I'll ever really get there. I wonder if I'll ever love God with my whole being, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor as myself so fully and continually that I'm able to love the way Jesus loved. And if you wonder, like I do, here's a word of encouragement for you. Don't let the wondering deter you from the practice. Practice doesn't make perfect, but practice sure does make better. And the world could use a whole lot of better. Imagine how different the world would be if we just obeyed that one commandment, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, Roar writes. It would be the most mighty political, social upheaval imaginable the world would be radically different if human beings really treated one another as they would like to be treated. We can take this as a simple rule of thumb. What would I want from that person right now? What would be helpful for me to receive? Well, there's our commandment. There's our obligation to do to others. It's so simple, we can see why we put all our attention on Ten Commandments or the hundreds of other regulations culture and religion place on us. It's much easier to worry about things that keep us pure, so to speak, but are of little consequence. Rabbi Sharon Boris offers an illustration that I think is on point. Say you're walking downtown in LA or Chicago or New York City. A naked man runs in front of you on the sidewalk screaming and cursing. What do you do? Most of us briskly cross the street. That guy is unwell, we think. <coughs> but say you live in a tiny town, maybe 50 households. You're walking around one day and a naked man runs in front of you on the sidewalk screaming and cursing. And because you live in a tiny town, you know him, it's Henry. And last week, you just happened to know there was a terrible tragedy, a fire that burned Henry's house to the ground, leaving him with nothing. What do you do? Henry, you say, Come with me, friend. You need a warm meal and a safe place to stay. What does it take to shift our collective consciousness from stranger who is unwell to Henry, my neighbor, created in God's image? The change is to imagine a fundamentally different reality a world in which we recognize and fight for each other's dignity, a world in which we train our hearts to see even the people others might render invisible, a world in which we recognize that we, images of the divine, are all bound up in the bond of life with one another. And our hardest, holiest work is to not look away. Friends, this is the table of love. Here at this table, I receive love. I taste love in the bread and cup as I surely tasted it in my mother's spaghetti and meat sauce. 
Here at the table, I'm reminded that I am not defined by my mistakes, nor by my what ifs, nor by any brokenness of heart. Here at this table, I'm reminded that I am defined by love. And love always calls me forward. The love I experience here at this table calls me to share it with the world. And so the table of love requires much of us. It insists that we love one another as we love ourselves and that we love ourselves as we love others. Love asks that we raise one another up by saying, yes, you are worthy. You are welcome at this table. Come and eat when we surrender to the mysterious ways of love, there's a good chance we will be surprised to find just how much love there is to go around. Amen.